Hello, and welcome to another Cyber Threat Alliance webinar. My name is Neil Jenkins, and I'm the Chief Analytic Officer at CTA. We're a nonprofit organization that brings cybersecurity providers together to share information and collaborate on the latest cyber threats. Uh, joining me today uh, from CTA member SonicWall is Alex Dubrovsky. Alex is the Vice President of Software Engineering and Threat Research and oversees all SonicWall Cyber Threat Prevention Security Services and heads up the SonicWall Capture Labs Threat Research Team. Today, Alex is going to talk to us about what SonicWall's threat researchers observed in 2021 and offer their analysis on the latest trends in malware and exploit types and techniques. So this webinar is based off of SonicWall's 2022 Cyber Threat Report, which is available on their website at sonicwall.com, and I encourage you to go and check it out. It's a great report. Uh, before we start, just a bit of logistics. Uh, viewers can ask questions in the Q&A window of the webinar, and we're going to do our best to incorporate any questions that we receive into the discussion. So why don't we get right to it? Alex, why don't you tell us about SonicWall's Capture Labs threat network and how it works? Absolutely, uh, thank you, Neil. Um, so first, uh, we, we can start by describing what SonicWall Capture Labs threat network is. It's essentially over a million global sensors located in more than 200 countries and territories. Um, what, what are these networks centers? These are essentially inline network security devices that can be located either at the edge of somebody's network, in the internal segments of somebody's network, or also in their data centers or front uh, or front end um, uh, co uh, companies, DMZs, where all the servers are located. So it's essentially. Uh, over a million network security devices, I thought the marketing term for them would be next generation firewalls that constantly monitor all traffic that goes in and out of the network. Uh, the traffic is monitored across all ports and protocols. Um, and uh, we're even capable of uh, decrypting SSL traffic and seeing what's inside of, of SSL traffic. So this threat report is based on the data that has been gathered through various detection techniques on these network security devices. And uh, the way the statistics are gathered, anytime there is any kind of detection, whether it's a malware detection, an export detection, any other type of detection, uh, that statistic is being accumulated and then we produce a statistical summary and we can provide um, this type of statistical analysis. So what you will see is various data that we gather from these network security devices over the year 2021. And we can start with a high level summary of our findings in terms of volume of various kinds of events observed. As you can see, in most event categories, uh, the number has increased in comparison to the previous year, uh, was only one category um, going down, and that is a specific malware attacks, and we can talk about that later, but I will give you a preview that it does have something to do with the pandemic, and it does have something to do with the fact that uh, a lot and most of our devices are located at the places where people work, and when people work remotely, obviously, given that malware is a lot of is user interaction driven, you will see a bit less detection from users. So this is this is actually normal. So one interesting thing is despite the fact that the overall um, volume of malware uh, detected was slightly down, the amount of ransomware has jumped enormously. Uh, the number of encrypted threats, and in this case, the encrypted threats, uh, we're talking about specifically malware that is detected inside of SSL protocol. That went up significantly. Uh, IoT exploits have increased as well. So here, I just want my clarification. When we're talking about IoT events uh, that you see on this chart, we're talking about um, 
not necessarily detection of things like, uh, to give an example, Mirai or VPN filter. We're talking about actual exploitation attempts of various IoT devices. Uh, for those who are familiar with this area, this would be common in things like NetGear, Dealing Clouders, um, for various uh, video cameras that are IT connected. So Alex, if you can back real quick on that slide, I just wanted to clarify something for our viewers. Um, when you when you say that you've seen 623 million ransomware attacks, for example, that's not actually 623 million organizations that have been impacted, right? That's 623 million no. protections it, of ransomware on your network. That's right? absolutely correct. So this is total number of transmissions but basically total number of transmission attempts across the network of a particular ransomware across all the sensors that they have shown on the previous slide. Right. So this, 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 this 623 million does not represent network, it represents individual malware transmissions stop, malware downloads, malware propagations, Great. And, and I think this is a really good example of one of the reasons why CTA exists and one of the things that we try to do for the, the community. So SonicWall has, you know, your view of the world. So you're, it's pretty network based. You're focused on volumetric attacks that are happening all over the world. And through CTA, you can combine your insights with the insights from other members of ours that focus maybe on Absolutely. endpoint detections or another that focuses on targeted attacks through their incident response capabilities. And then we can bring that all together to allow you to fuse that information and give you a leg up and allows you to better understand the threat space and protect their customers using data from many of our other companies. Absolutely. And in fact, it's very important. Uh, one of the reasons I've shown the previous slides, it's very important to, to understand how the data was gathered and at what point these measurements are actually being taken. So yeah, here, uh, this is one, this is kind of the sonic view of the world and vast majority of essential exclusive on the press report, uh, the, the view of sonic comes from uh, measuring and from looking at various kind of network traffic and identifying threats within, within that traffic. So yes, and as you, uh, as you mentioned in your comment, uh, depending on what your organization is looking at where the measurements are taken, you may see slightly, you may see slightly different data. And yeah, it's, it's always good to look at different viewpoints and, and understand where you see why certain statistics shows up here, but not that. Absolutely. I said, great. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your key findings? Absolutely. So as you saw in the previous slide, the ransomware, is going up. Uh, I will show a little bit more granular malware detection charts just so that you can see where it was declining and where it might be going up. Um, we're going to talk about um, whether we're seeing patterns of increasing amount of malware, which require much more sophisticated detection techniques. And here we're talking about how these are sneak preview. We're going to be talking uh, dynamic analysis malware techniques. Uh, we'll show you um, a scale of the recently appeared work for J vulnerability. Basically, we'll show you at what scale it was exploited. Uh, we'll We'll describe how the crypto jackings has increased. We will talk a little bit about the attacks over non standard ports. Again, this is another very, very interesting metric that is available to you by measuring through a networking device. This will actually tell you how attackers, are, whether attackers are utilizing evasion techniques, which include uh, sending traffic and non standard ports. So as, uh, as mentioned previously, the global uh, ransomware detections have gone up. And you can see um, the comparison between 2020 and 2021. And again, that is, um, ransomware is clearly becoming the weapon of choice. 
And the explanation is very easy. There's obviously a very easy way to monetize ransomware. So it does make sense that we continue seeing the ransomware uh, detections going up. And again, this is not just an uh, increase from 2020 to 2021. This is actually a significant increase over the last three years that we're observing. Uh, this increase is seen um, among um, US, UK, Germany. Germany had a huge increase, if, uh, according to our data. So, so this is not uh, just specific to one and this is not just specific to one country. We're seeing this across the board uh, geographically. So, Alex, do you have any um, idea why the uh, large increase in Germany specifically? Uh, yes, uh, actually, I do. Um, the ransomware uh, family that was uh, responsible for uh, German spike was sober in our case. We observed um, transmission. We observed significant increase in uh, tr transmission of sober malware samples uh, to our networking devices. Hmm. Okay. And server is more of a ransomware type that affects kind of individual uh, endpoints, right? It's not one of the families that kind of does the big game hunting, kind of taking down organizations. Is that right? Uh, probably, uh, pro probably yes. You will see this more uh, what I would describe as a volume attack rather than a very specific target attack. And when we're talking about volume attack, let's say you you got yourself a list of uh, hundred thousand email addresses and a bunch of links. You got some subset of people to click on them. You manage to install ransomware on their personal computer or laptop. You don't really know, you didn't really target any specific network necessarily, any specific device. You don't really know what the map of the network looks like. You don't really know what resources are on that network. You infected impacted something and hopefully you encrypted something while you encrypted data on the laptop, which has something valuable, and you collect <laughs> your payment or the person is going to decrypt versus somebody wanting to target a um, very specific network by acting a user account credential of a very specific administrator to various means and going them swapping to make sure the 2FA is covered as well, and then identifying very specific valuable resources inside the network, such as your source control server, or plasion to, uh, tools, and GR, and, forms, and encrypting resources on the network that you found to be very valuable. And that takes more time and effort, and probably the price goes up as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> per, 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 per target in that one. But yeah, so what, we, what we're seeing mostly is probably what I would call, it's not that we're not seeing targeted attacks at all, but it would be fair to say that majority of the attacks that we are seeing from, from an historical perspective are kind of mass market, uh, what I would call volume, volume attacks. That would be a fair statement, I think. Great, thank you. So in terms of um, which um, which ransomware uh, family was the top, at our, in our case, it was Ryuk. That was um, that was our top head for the last two years. And as you can see, you can see what what the numbers are again. That's what we're absorbing in terms of which malware families are, which malware samples are being transport to our networking devices onto, onto the customer networks. Um, 
Another thing, and this is uh, something I alluded to earlier, is that when we don't just look at the ransomware, but we look at all of the malware, origins, and, and, and everything else in ransomware, uh, the volume has actually decreased slightly. And you can even see um, on this chart that the decrease in volume is actually <laughs> directly tied to the pandemic. If you look at 2020, you can see that the first few months are starting out pretty high and then just goes down. And that is easily, that is easily explained. Also, this, this is actually uh, a fairly straightforward con conclusion because when we're talking about malware, we're talking about something that requires user interaction versus an exploit. If I want to exploit a vulnerability in a server, I don't need users to come into the office. It is a, an, ex, uh, an exploit against running a uh, public or accessible server, does not require user interaction. I can just exploit it and uh, do something afterwards depending upon which vulnerability I exploited. In the case of malware, typically malware installations do require typically some kind of user interaction. If I send you a sample in an attachment, you need to click it. If I send you a link, <laughs> you need to click it. So, so not having, given that uh, most of our devices are located in, uh, in, the, in the offices and networks where people are employed, it does make sense that people not being in the offices cause the overall volume to go down. But as you can see, if you look at kind of the second half of 2021, it does appear that likely people are coming back. <laughs> and we can, uh, we can tell. Yeah, and I think it's important to note too that even though this was one of the few things on your on your chart at the beginning that didn't have a big increase, we're still talking about huge numbers here, right? Like almost 500 million. Yes, that's absolutely. It, it's, it's not a small amount still. It's It's just kind of stable. Uh, the, yeah, uh, absolutely. The, uh, the numbers are uh, the numbers are pretty significant, and also um, it doesn't. It probably does not mean that in general overall malware in the world has gone down. It simply means that um, we are not measuring these downloads in a place where we measure it for the support. So if somebody has a laptop in their home and they're not going to a VPN or whatever malware they downloaded in their home um, is not propagating itself to a VPN tunnel, then most likely uh, this is something that um, we may not see for the purposes of how the data was gathered for this particular chat support. So this does not necessarily mean um, that the overall malware in the world has gone down. It's just even how we measure it and where we measure it, it does make sense that it can, the counts went down at those points. So um, uh, for this type of presentation, I, <laughs> I try to avoid, uh, given that our uh, Target audience and majority of our target audience is like a threat research community. Uh, I would typically try to avoid talking about any specific proprietary technology because uh, I, I think it would be more uh, relevant to simply present threat findings. And this is one of the slides uh, where it Touches a little bit on the proprietary technology uh, that we have, that our own proprietary technology that we have, but I will give a slightly different angle on how to look uh, at this data. So, what, what this data shows is how many threats, and in this case, uh, malware, specific or malware samples, have been detected using a very sophisticated dynamic analysis. So, you can think of it this way. If some basic static analysis failed, 
um, look up into well-known third party um, malware collection repository tales. If basic static AI based or DL based and ML based analysis failed, then you do really need um, a very sophisticated dynamic analysis to detect the threat. And this is more of an interesting information for uh, both in threat research community and security professionals who are deploying various security technology in their networks. So you can look at this data in the following way. Even though the overall number of malware that we looked at was slightly less, the amount of malware that required a very sophisticated dynamic analysis is continuing to go up. So in other words, um, the type of malware samples that intentionally bypass various static analysis techniques, and even the static analysis techniques associated with machine learning and deep learning technologies. So there are a lot more threats that can bypass them, and we do need a very sophisticated dynamic analysis to make sure you have all the latest malware threats detected as you see them first. So that, that's the angle that I would like to present on this slide. Now, uh, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about intrusions or actual exploits. And this is something that uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, this includes any kind of server exploitation. And what we're seeing here is actually really probably not surprising because some of the top type of threats that we're detecting against solar are remote file access. So this is very basic, <laughs> not a very sophisticated exploitation. This is something like uh, trying to get FC passwords. <laughs> something something as basic as this. And directory traversals are kind of similar. Uh, this is not something that requires a significant level of sophistication and we are seeing a lot of these attempts. Um, along the other lines, uh, obviously remote code execution exploits that are reading the exploits that are exporting vulnerability, uh, vulnerabilities that target remote code execution. So there, SQL injections are there. I suspect if something like log4j showed up not in December, but much earlier in the year, we would see <laughs> RCE would move up. And I will show you a chart later, later in this presentation so you can see, um, so you can actually see the scale at which uh, what Code J was propagating. In fact, um, mm -hmm. here's the chart. Um, in case you're wondering uh, at what scale will work for J exploitation attempts. Uh, we're on about several months ago, okay? just, uh, just on our networks. This is this is the level to which uh, work for J was exploited, yeah. which is quite, quite significant. That's really amazing, yeah, agreed. Yeah, and then and it, do, it, it, it does make sense because um, the proof of concept was there, it was pretty well explained how how you can utilize it and whoever was doing it probably took POC and made some modifications. Off they went. Uh, now let's talk about uh, crypto jacking. Uh, crypto jacking has also increased in comparison to last year at about 19%. So, um, so crypto jacking is still relevant. And people, I guess, want to improve their profit margins on crypto mining by using somebody else's CPU resources instead of their own. And that's, uh, that's what we're seeing here. 
Um, now, in terms of IoT exploits, prior to 2021, we actually saw a significant increase in IoT exploits. And most people are talking about uh, various well known routers that they called on, like uh, that they were well published in our dosages of Netgear, Dealing, and others that were in our dosages, and uh, various cameras. And uh, we do continue seeing the increase in IoT exploitations, although in 2021 that increase was much smaller. It was 6% versus uh, the type of increases that we saw in previous year. We suspect that this is likely a temporary pause because the IoT device, the number of IoT devices is simply exploding. So if, if we had to make a prediction, we, we would say it is likely that in subsequent years, the, the number of potential export attempts would continue going at uh, fairly significant percentages. Uh, here's another interesting uh, piece of data that you can find out by uh, looking at detections to a networking device. So this means what uh, this describes uh, what percentage of malware was downloaded over non-standard ports. So let me give you an example. Let's say for basic HTTP traffic, the standard port is 80. Let's say a threat actor is hosting malware sample on the web show, but not on port. But that web show is not running on port 80, it's running on port 3333 or something like that. So that would be an example of download over a non standard port. And why would threat actors use non standard ports? It's simply to evade uh, networking devices. There was a perception that networking devices may not handle non-standard ports as well as standard ports, and this is simply another evasion technique that threat actors can use. Now, the interesting observation here, if this is an evasion technique, then how can we explain that in 2021, the percentage of uh, malware detected in non-standard ports has gone down? And we, we, we do have an interest in this. Uh, there are probably multiple reasons, but probably the primary one, primary one is uh, we believe more security administrators are creating more restrictive configurations on their network. So in other words, they're simply closing non-standard, certain non-standard ports outbound. And for the threat actors, it means that they're, um, their attempt to install malware on somebody's PC, the, the probability of that attempt goes down if the non, if the administrators are making their network configurations much more restrictive. So that would be um, kind of the primary hypothesis behind um, the data we're, we're observing. And secondly, it's likely that. Um, network security data vendors have improved their non standard for detections as well. But most likely uh, security administrators are creating more restrictive configurations on their network on, on their network. So that is um, like that is uh, the most likely explanation for what we're seeing. Okay. Um, now, another interesting statistic. So here we're showing a chart of global malware spread. And what is, I would like to define what, uh, what malware spread percentage is. That means out of um, X number of devices, what percentage of devices saw at least one malware detection. And this is broken down by region. And if you look, uh, if you look at something like North America, it fluctuates between 50 and 20 percent. And when you look at it, you might first say, "I mean, this is this is fine, but at that time, I, I would have expected, I would I would have expected a higher percentage of um, 
I would expect a higher percentage of the network to at least be one malware that I can unroot. And the answer here is you have to look at this data very carefully. In other words, here we're measuring specific malware detection. Now, what, what people have to realize is that the security configuration that system administrators do, it's multi-layered. So in other words, they don't just enable uh, malware detection on our devices. They also enable uh, web filtering. They also enable botnet filtering. They also enable intrusion prevention, which looks at uh, client-side exploits. So before we even get, so before we even get to a real malware download attempt, an attack can be stopped by simply not letting the user um, not letting the user access a suspicious website. Attack can be stopped because somebody tried to go to an IP which is in the blacklist. Attack can be stopped um, because so what? let's say a browser exploit was stopped before the browser exploit actually succeeded and attempted to download a malware sample because this is the typical kill chain of, um, of browser exploitation. So in other words, the way the data has, and to just to give another example, a lot of people deploy Office 365, so when you send somebody a malicious link, the, plugins or Microsoft themselves with an Office 365 may not allow the email to. So the way you have to look at this data is this is percentage of networks that saw at least one malware propagation um, attempt after all the other layers of defense have been exhausted. And if you look at this data in such a way, then these percentages would actually appear more reasonable. So please, when, when you look at the data, keep in mind that there are multiple layers of defense that are enabled by network administrators, and a number of them would actually stop a subsequent malware attack before the actual malware download that then happens. So, and if you look at the data this way, it, it would seem more reasonable, which also brings another question. Um, if you notice, since we broke it down by region, let's say in South America, this percentage fluctuates um, between 25 and 30 plus percent. And again, this is um, this would actually be a good research project for somebody. It is possible that maybe blacklists for sites uh, which which are targeted at South American users are not being updated as, mm -hmm. as well as they are for North American users because uh, the target sites would be different for different regions. So that, that, that in itself would actually be an interesting research topic. We have not done it, but there are possibilities like that. And uh, another interesting data point that we have, so we have the ability to measure um, the percentage of malware that downloaded over SSL encrypted tunnels. We call them encrypted threads, but for clarification, these are actual malware samples that are propagating over SSL encrypted tunnels. And the way we measure the statistics, we actually only look, we only look at units which have at least one malware detection attempt reported that is over SSL. So in other words, they have that SSL decryption feature enabled. And you can see these percentages. Um, these percentages are even more than, um, than what you saw in the previous slide with, uh, in terms of what percentage of malware is being detected being detected uh, over SSL. Uh, overall amount of malware over SSL has increased, but the percentages are in the ranges that you see on this chart.
And I think okay. this concludes this concludes our presentation. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Alex. Um, so thanks to everyone who joined us for today's CTA webinar. We'd like to thank Alex and the Sonic Wall team for participating today. Um, if you're interested in membership in the Cyber Threat Alliance, please go to our website at cyberthreatalliance.org to learn more about us and click contact to reach out to our membership team. So uh, thanks again to Alex. We really appreciate everybody uh, tuning in and we appreciate your time today. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks.